I'll share the link once you're live and you can also share the link if you like. Let me go to it that we're about to start. Yay, thank you. I'll share the link once you're live and you can also share the link if okay. you like. I think I'm double now. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so um, here's the YouTube link. And we still have one more minute. Um, I'm going to also share this. Okay, so right. um, yeah, we start. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our second colloquium lectures at AI Saturday Lagos. My name is Tejimari Afonja, and I'm the co founder and co organizer of AI Saturday Lagos. AI Saturday Lagos, for those of us who know the community, is, is a community of enthusiasts, practitioners, and researchers. We organize annual cohorts and participate in other various activities like this colloquium series. So today we are very privileged and honored to have Mr. Kola Tumbosu for our second colloquium talk. He's the founder of YorubaName.com, a documentation project aimed at translating the linguistic and cultural resources of Yoruba language into a publicly accessible online format. He's also known for his work on the Nigerian English um, Google Assist Assistant. So if you've ever used the Google map and it sounds like a Nigerian, then you know what to think for. <laughs> so um, Kala will be giving a presentation on the limitations and opportunities in language technology for the developing continent. And we are so glad to have you here today, Kala. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. The floor is yours now. Please proceed with your talk. Thank you very much, Teju Made, for having me. Um, and thank you, Doug, for coming. Uh, I, I was mentioned earlier that <laughs> my professor uh, who gave me first my first job in the US is right here as well. So I'm going to try to keep the pressure very, very uh, contained. Um, so um, it's a colloquium, so I'm, I'm going to try to make it as lively as possible so that we don't sleep off. <laughs> um, I chose this topic because um, it's close to something I've thought about for, you know, many years, uh, the limitations and opportunities in language technology for Africa, uh, for any or any developing continent, any developing space. Um, and some of the issues I will mention here that you'll see might um, be similar to many of the issues that many other communities might have. And perhaps that would, you know, give them an idea of how to also approach that, the issues they might find there. Um, I've been in language technology for uh, about a decade or thereabout. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, you know, my name is Colato Bosso. Um, I have an MA from Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville, small town in Southern Illinois and a Bachelor of Arts in Linguistics um, from the University of Ibadan, 2005. Um, 2004 was actually when I first consciously, I think, um, started thinking about the possibilities of language technology. At the time, Google was just uh, about seven years old or thereabout. Um, I don't think it was even known as a, uh, a company doing things in language. It was just a search engine or thereabout. I entered the university in 2000, year 2000. And so you can tell that when I went to linguistics, I had no idea that I would have any opportunity to, to work in, uh, in a tech company as a linguist. Uh, as many of you might know, um, or, might, or might think, um, linguistics is, you know, deals with language and the structure of language and the internal, um, you know, uh, workings of a language or how it can be used. And many people, of course, assume that linguists speak so many different languages. Some of us do, some of us don't, um, but we never think um, at least when I was entering university, I never thought that, you know, all the opportunities that exist in technology would eventually uh, 
come to, to um, into my onto my space to work on. Even though we had, you know, theoretically we we knew that linguistics was you know was useful in different ways. Um, forensic linguistics, people who work with crime fighters and stuff like that. Um, but many of us thought, you know, we would just get out and maybe either become professors in the university or like um, work in broadcast institutions, etc. So, um, so the possibilities was kind of limited. So, I, I'm I, so in 2015 um, uh, during a conference of uh, West African languages called Walk 2004, I was privileged to be invited to join the um, the um, local organizing committee. I was in charge of the website. I was helping um, people who were uh, sending abstracts and stuff to process their, their their papers, communicating, connecting them basically with the um, the organizing committee, the professors. And so I was close enough to understand how um, you know conference those kind of conferences were run. They didn't know as much about you know the website, the internet, and all of that. I could design a website. I designed the website, um, but I used the opportunity to look at the abstracts and you know kind of get some ideas uh, from what language scholars at the time were doing. Um, but there was a part of it that was really fascinating, fascinating to me, and that was um, a collaboration that my department then had with um, African Language Technologies Initiative, Alt-I, um, run by Dr. Tunde Adibola, whom some of you might know. And, you know, it was the first time we were having somebody who was not in linguistics come participate in the linguistics conference. He was an engineer, um, and he had a lot of ideas about how language could work um, with technology. Um, some of which sounded obtuse and I, I didn't quite understand, but uh, in some way gave me, you know, opened my eyes at least to the possibilities of several things that could happen. And I, I believe many of the people who were in university at the time too didn't quite understand what um, Adibola was always talking about. Um, but um, Egbohare, Francis Egbohare, who was my uh, head of department, head of department at the time, was kind of a visionary to at least understand that there was something there and from that collaboration. and. Um, so we went to Alt I and we saw some of those computers, um, you know, pronouncing words and stuff like that. And you know, it was just fascinating. Like, okay, technology is interesting. I've always been interested in technology, but I didn't know that language could work together with it. I didn't know much about linguistics either. But in being in that space at the right time, it gave me access to all the ideas I had. So um, I found a Yoruba name that came in 2015. This was an extension of my bachelor's project. Um, my, when I left university, my the last uh, essay, I, I, it wasn't an essay, it was a project, which was, um, a multi, I called it a multimedia dictionary of Yoruba names. At the time, all my mates were writing um, long essays, you know, in hardbound books. And it just didn't interest me. I knew I could do that, but I wanted to do something really, really great. So I said to my professor again, Meg Buhari, that I would like to have, um, to create a multimedia dictionary Somebody had published a book at the time, uh, Professor Babalola, and that was titled A Dictionary of Yoruba Names. So I was like, this is a book, and if you want to have all the names in one place, how do you account for the fact that there are new names every day, there are new names, you, you can never exhaust all the names in the language in a book, uh, and that several people who have this book may not even know how to pronounce it. Um, one, because some of the tone markings were wrong, and second, because if you give it to a foreigner, he's going to look at it uh, he will see the meaning of the name in English, but he doesn't have to pronounce it quite. Um, so I said, it would be nice to have a project. I'm going to make a CD and I'm going to get a thousand of these names, some from this book, some from my own resources. And I'm going to have someone pronounce all of the names. And, you know, so it will be an online, uh, a, 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 a digital dictionary where you can have the names, you click on it and you hear the pronunciation and then you see the meaning. And thankfully he agreed. And then I got a couple of friends together and then I got all the names. I got a definition, I wrote the HTML code. So the project was on the CD and I submitted it. So it was in 2015, I was now thinking after 10 years, you know, this project I did in university, it would be nice to have this project put online for more people to add new names to it. Um, and hopefully that would expand. I mean, I, I realized that the book that the professor, the professor died. So of course the book, the book can be expanded and there are many other names that his book didn't cover. So it'd be nice to have a place online where people can find the, the meaning of Yoruba names, the pronunciation, um, and be able to add new names themselves and correct the errors that might exist. Um, so so I, I, I set up the thing, I got some volunteers, we raised some money and then we created the, the, the site. But the, the, the technology aspect of it came when I was trying to figure out how to 
get the pronunciation of names. When I was doing the undergraduate project, um, I got friends to record the names for me. And that was just a thousand names. It took a long time. Now I, I'm thinking of having all the names in Yoruba in one place online. I can't get people to record each one as soon as I put it there. Um, that would be a big uh, expense if I had to pay someone to do that. Also, you can't rely on one person forever. That means you have different voices for different names and then that would, I wouldn't like that. Um, so I was thinking there had to be a, a technological way to create this, uh, this project and make it automated, you know? But nobody had done anything for, for Yoruba in that way. I, I mean, and, and by 2015, of course, we, we've had Siri, we've had Google Voice and all of this. So I knew that there was a, there was a way to get uh, computers to, to pronounce um, names uh, and to, or, to, or to speak. You know, we had Siri, you can talk to your iPhone and it responds to you. But nobody had done for Yoruba. And I knew that it was possible, but I didn't know how. And all I had was my linguistics knowledge and my knowledge of Yoruba. So what I did was sit down one day and um, that was in early, uh, I think it was 2000. And this was, the dictionary had come on live, but it, had, it didn't have an audio element. So it just had names and the meaning and people liked it. But I always wanted to have that audio part. And all the dictionaries I'd seen, the Oxford University, Oxford dictionaries and stuff, you could just click on it and you hear the pronunciation of, the, of any word you find there. Um, so um, so I, I sat down one day and then, you know, spent hours and hours just thinking of how do I bring Yoruba, which is a tone language for many of you who don't know, uh, which means that each uh, syllable has a different tone and each a change of tone can change the meaning of a word. How do I make this, um, how do I simplify Yoruba in such a way that I can isolate all the syllables um, and then have it recorded? This is an exhaustive uh, uh, number of syllables. Um, and as soon as I record it, I'll have all the possible sounds in Yoruba in one place. And all I need to do then is to create rules of how they interact with each other and get somebody who knows knowledge of computer to create, to use those rules to create um, a software using the audio that I recorded to pronounce the words. And then thankfully I found someone who was Yoruba. So who knew what I was trying to achieve um, but also knew, um, uh, was a software engineer. I think she learned Py Python. Python was what she used for the work. So what I needed to do was sit down and then write the rules, which took like hundreds of pages writing. You know, when you combine this tone with this tone, the phonological uh, patterns that happen and this name change, this tone sounds like this when they're standing beside each other. And when they're alone, it sounds like this. Probably assimilation yeah, in linguistics, but I don't want to give you all the jargons. Um, so I did all of that, and then she, thankfully she understood it, and then she created it. And then we have the audio. Uh, we have the, the system where you could type any Yoruba name as long as they're properly tone marked. You could you could click, and then the computer will pronounce it for you. And I was very happy. Like finally, uh, um, having no knowledge of computer uh, uh, of um, coding or anything, just my knowledge of linguistics and uh, you know my competence in Yoruba. I was able to create something that people can use. And so while, we, while the intention was to make sure you could use it in a dictionary, I did that. People can now click on any name in the dictionary and anytime you add a new name, we don't need to get anybody to pronounce it. All the combination I already pronounced was sufficient because the rules are there. The computer just puts them together and gets the name out because the rules are clearly stated. Um, so after doing that, I decided that, you know, it would be nice to have that as a standalone project as well, which was why we created the text uh, ttsyoruba.com, text to speech, which um, was my way of just saying, oh, anybody who is interested in, you know, hearing how Yoruba sounds, if you can get a properly tone marked Yoruba sentence or, or text, uh, word, put it there, click on it. If it's properly tone marked, you would get the proper pronunciation. And hopefully it can also become a source that people can use to learn, you know, make mistakes and learn how Yoruba tones work or how to pronounce a name that you've seen somewhere. That's a, a little detour. So like I said, I don't code. Um, much of my work is in linguistics and language activism and language advocacy. Um, but in, after this 2015 experiment, later in the year, somebody who had heard of all the things I was doing, um, sent me an email saying, oh, you might be, so you might, somebody you know might be interested in this job opportunity. It was uh, an opening for a project manager at Google. And even though they had turned to me thinking I, I suddenly would know somebody because I was linguistics, I realized looking at the job description that it was something I could do. I had, uh, they, they were looking for somebody who had some, ex, some knowledge of text to speech, who had some knowledge of Nigerian English and who um, uh, was interested in, who had a linguistics background. 
And so I looked at it and I said, well, this is me and thank you for sending it to me. Another person sent me the same link the next day and I was like, okay, uh, maybe the world is telling me something. At this time, I was teaching English at a high school. At, when I returned from the US for my master's in 2012, I started teaching English. So my background in understanding how Nigerian, how English was taught in secondary school and my own personal conflict with how we were still using British curriculum and American curriculum um, to teach uh, students um, for instance, you know, in the, 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 the sounds, the diphthongs and all that, we're still mostly British RP. We're forcing our students' uh, throats and many of the students didn't understand it, especially because they didn't speak like that when they were on the streets. They spoke Nigerian English. Um, we say com. Um, the, the English would say come or something like that. Um, we would say um, go. And in Nigeria, we typically just say go. And many of those things are nuances that you don't uh, get if you're not uh, uh, a linguist. You might not understand why this, these things are different. But instinctively, many of my students understood it. So when I was teaching them and telling them, you know, when you're writing your exams, when they tell you what rhymes with go, uh, you know, you, a word like low rhymes with it. Um, in, in British English, in Nigerian English, probably not. Uh, low would probably sound different from go. So we don't have that deep down, we say, oh, and many of those things. So I will tell them, you know, I'm teaching you what I'm asked to teach you. So you have to pay attention to that, but you should be free and proud to speak your own way, the way you want to speak when you're out on the street. And so, you know, my own understanding and, and interest in that distinction between what I taught and what I knew they spoke like also helped uh, when I was now applying for the Google job to say that, I am intimately familiar with Nigerian English. They were looking for somebody who will lead a team uh, to create a Nigerian English voice for Google Assistant and Google products. Again, I had no knowledge of coding or software engineering. You know, when you hear Google, the first thing you think of is, you know, software engineering and stuff like that. But, you know, but I knew that I had the competence they wanted. So I, I had to prove myself. So I told them, you know, what my observations about Nigerian English and what I knew made Nigerian English different from British or American English. I told them of the text to speech application I've created for Yoruba name. Um, and I told them my master's um, uh, thesis, which had examined the influence of tone in how Americans uh, who are learning Yoruba, uh, you know, uh, fare. So it seemed that I was a, right, a perfect person at the right moment and I was in the right place. Um, and so I got a Google job. And so I led the team and that was that. And the product came out in 2008, uh, 2018, I think. Um, 2018 or 2019, I'm not sure now, where, you know, now many of, uh, many of Nigerians can now use their Google Maps and assistant in a Nigerian English accent, which pronounced things the way Nigerians typically would with the right um, um, accents, uh, different from how it used to pronounce it, um, you know, when it was just British English or American English options that they had. So those were the things that I'd been doing. Um, and so my talk here today is just to tell you a little bit about, you know, what I found over the years, uh, obstacles and opportunities in language technology, um, as well as some of my experiences. I'll probably demonstrate some of these things I talked about uh, earlier if I have some time or if any question leads to it. Um, as a creative writer, I've also written, tried to write in Yoruba. I'm interested in the language and its survival. Um, I've been doing a lot of translation from English to Yoruba and from Yoruba into English. Um, I'll talk about that uh, much more. So language technology. I assume that not everybody here on the, knows what language technology is. So I'm going to just give a little um, definition, which I found online. Um, also called human language technology. We just talked about studies, methods of how we use computer programs to analyze, produce, modify, or respond to human language texts and speech. In other words, we're talking about how we use uh, how to use technology to like mimic speech, or to power speech, or to um, do the things that humans typically do with language. I assume that you know this is important because technology, as we know it, has done many things to either simplify or speed up the things we normally do as humans uh, anyway. So, um, so it's just natural that language technology also becomes a part of it. Um, so it includes, some people call it computational linguistics. That's a subset, I think. Natural language processing is also another subset. Sometimes they use them interchangeably, um, but each of them focuses on uh, different things. 
So language, uh, natural language processing basically is about, you know, um, something like Siri or Google Voice, where you take human voice and then you use the computer to turn it into something um, that can that can work on the computer when the human is no longer there. Um, you process human language to make it work. So the speech technology as well is under language technology because, like I said, language is just a whole lot of things, including writing, reading, speaking, listening, etc. But when we talk about speech technology, that's more specific to things that have to do with speech, human speech, like Siri, like Google Voice, like the TTS Yoruba that I talked about, um, voice assistants um, on devices um, that give you options to speak to them and hear back from them, screen readers that can see what's on your screen and then read it back to you for people who are sometimes dis uh, are disabled or who just want to have the computer do the work that they don't want to do or voice controls on ATM machines. Some of these ATM machines use just normal human recordings. So it's not really interacting with you. It's doing things that have been programmed there, but there are some that are more interactive, you know, uh, or voices you hear in customer service lines where it tells you, you know, you have pressed one, is that your answer? And then you say yes, and then it processes it and understands it and then gives you something to do. Um, then, but language technology also includes a number of other things that are not just speech. So like um, when you want to write on a computer, um, you know, the, the text you have to write with, the text I used to write this thing, it's a kind of language technology because you know, writing is also a part of language. Creating keyboards um, for computers and mobile devices is also a kind of language technology. Um, and we kind of take these things for granted until we realize that not everybody has their languages on the computer. There are many people, uh, parts of the world where the languages probably don't even have scripts at all to write with. Um, and there are some languages who, um, uh, you know, have very small number of users. And so people who create computer technology don't think of them when they think of putting languages on, on the computer. My computer, for instance, now, I, you know, it probably has an option, option for French or for German, Russian, and there, but there's some, it probably doesn't have for maybe Zulu or, you know, uh, Amharic or something like that. Um, so there is there are issues uh, with what languages are prioritized and all that. I'm going to mention that as part of the problems that I've encountered uh, in the past. So why do we need language technology? I've mentioned this earlier. Um, efficiency, I guess, and speed. Just like you know, why do we need cars when they're horses? You know, um, when the computer is there to solve problems we get to, you know, it's solving some problems. Language technology is also solving some problems. So optical character recognition, OCR, I mentioned earlier, where, um, you know, you can have a text on paper, you want it on your computer. You, instead of typing it, you can have it scanned. That's a kind of language technology. Audio books and screen readers, I mentioned earlier as well. Audio books mostly, I think, are read by humans. Uh, you, somebody goes in the studio and records and stuff. But there are screen readers um, where, you know, it's a text that the computer has never seen before, but you just put it there and it sees it and then it reads it back to you. There are limitations there when they don't understand your the, the words there, for instance. So for the Google Assistant I was talking about earlier, before we did the Nigerian English voice, um, there were some streets, street names that the British English voice couldn't pronounce properly. So it would say, there's a famous street in, uh, in uh, Koyi, it would say, um, Turn left on Bayo, Bayo Kuku Road. Uh, the word was bio, but uh, they, there's no way the British English uh, accent uh, could figure it out and say Bayo Kuku. So having um, a voice that recognizes the accent and, the, and the, how things are pronounced helps. And it brings a lot of people who would otherwise not want to use the tool, like taxi drivers and people who, who are not like, you know, middle-class educated people, society, to be able to use the one that gives them access to the right accent and all. Of course, the reverse is also the case when I went to the UK and I had to use my Nigerian English voice on my phone, deliberately also because I wanted to see how to pronounce the British English names. <laughs> and this is like uh, Leicester. Leicester. I was wondering whether I had to say Leicester, which is what it looks like on text. But for some reason it said Leicester. So I assume we did a good job. But there were some other, text, some other um, uh, street names that I, I found very funny, it sounded very funny when the Nigerian English uh, voice, you know, uh, computer tried to pronounce it. Um, and so 
that's why we pay attention to to access to to accessibility to representation to make sure that you know people who are using uh, computer are not left behind just because of the fact that there's just one big language and you know let's not care about every other one uh, there so um, I want to talk about inclusion as well, which is, I think, actually one of the most important reasons we use uh, language technology. There are people who can see, for instance, and the only thing they depend on is their phones being able to speak, uh, pronounce what is happening on the screen. So somebody left a comment, somebody sent you a message, it just reads it out to you. Um, but we always, always assume that the person using it in Nigeria, I'm talking about now, um, speaks in English. And so when the person who is blind also does not speak English, then there is no phone service, no accessibility option there for them to be able to get the thing to pronounce what is happening on the screen for them. Uh, because of course, Google Translate isn't very good with Yoruba or many African languages. So therefore, even if you use translation, um, what is translated usually doesn't, uh, it's not good. And Google Translate doesn't pronounce Yoruba words anyway. So it's not going to work. So there are, you know, reasons why we need many of these uh, technologies. Um, and many people have already benefited from them, but because of language exclusion that many people kind of overlook, um, there are issues, you know, there's a reason for many, many people like us to get into the field to make sure that these issues are raised. And, um, you know, as much as we can do, we do as well to help uh, bring more people into technology. Um, so I've talked about uh, this already in the past. Gboard, I had not mentioned. Gboard, well, before I left Google, one of the things we did was, um, Gboard was starting to be developed at the time, um, which is an app that allows you to write in any Nigerian language. Um, so Nigerian languages use tone. As you can see, when I write Yoruba there, I put some tone marks on it. This is a way to represent the tone in the syllable that is there. So Yoruba. Um, without the tone, the computer trying to pronounce this, my TTS voice trying to pronounce it would say Yoruba, which is not, which is not how it's pronounced. But the, the tone mark on the U is a low tone, the one on the A is a high tone, Yoruba. Um, so Gboard was created to help underserved communities around the world um, be able to, to text and to write in their languages. Again, there are many languages with no script at all. So I was, you know, the, the project started focusing on those who have scripts um, and then making sure that when you change the, your Gboard to a particular language, all the scripts you need to write in that uh, language can come up and then you can be able to text and write it to your friends. Um, of course, not many Nigerians use this because there are also attitudinal issues where people assume that, why do you need to write uh, that English is always the way we write in English without any tone marks was sufficient, and you don't need to, you know, mark your words to, to communicate. Or many people don't even have the skills to be able to properly tone mark, so they don't spend time um, using um, apps like that. Um, so, so, um, so a big, a couple of obstacles I found in my experience uh, with language technology. Again, I said I am not a technologist per se. I have worked in the space. And some of these uh, issues that I have found, um, and there are probably others as well. I'm a linguist and my um, angle is usually to look at how we can make sure that more people are represented, more languages are represented, and that um, we are able to use technology to speak to these languages. And these languages are comfortable with the, the tools of technology that we are creating. So uh, Corpora is the first one, uh, which basically just means a body of, of texts. Um, for most language technology products, um, we need large bodies of text to make them work. So to be able to create a Nigerian English voice, uh, we needed thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of sentences written in Nigerian English style. Um, and then someone had to record them. And Google could do that because they had a lot of money. Um, for smaller languages, especially ones that people are doing you know, in their own living rooms, it's hard to get a large corpora. So for Yoruba, for instance, uh, for Nigerian English, you could go online and get almost any Nigerian blog. You would find kind of ways of speaking in Nigerian English and you can just extract that text and, you know, 
clean it up and make sure people can then record that and use it for your work. For Yoruba, it's not the same because when you go online, people haven't been writing Yoruba online for a long time um, because the attitudinal issues, like I mentioned earlier, most people speak English anyway. Um, and people think, well, I'm starting Yoruba, who am I writing to? So until 2017 or thereabouts, you could not find a one website where you could find properly written Yoruba texts, um, it, unless they're like digitized books from the Bible or some other space. Um, and then 2017, BBC Nigeria came and they started doing broadcast in Yoruba, Igbo and Hausa. Well, Hausa had been in existence for a while. Brit Igbo, Yoruba and Pigeon. And they had a website and they were pu publishing many of their texts right on the website. And so it created a space to have um, a corpus, to build a corpus that, you know, if you want to create a technological tools for, for our tool for Yoruba, you can then go to a place like that and get the text and then use it for whatever you want. Unfortunately, also, because BBC is a commercial enterprise, uh, commercial enterprise in some way, at, at least uh, for the British government, um, and I probably because of their manpower or what, for whatever reason, um, the texts, Yoruba text put on the website don't always have correct tone markings on them. When we were writing the uh, the style guide, the journalistic style guide, I was involved in the planning of that as well at the beginning. One of the things we insisted on was that when you publish anything in Yoruba, make sure it's properly tone marked, properly written, so that anyone write, reading it, uh, more than just getting the news and information from it, they can also use it as a way of learning the language. But over time, I think the instinct to get the news out has over, overcome the need to write them properly. So it's also not a very dependable source all the time for getting a corpus of Yoruba. So imagine now for languages that don't even have a corporation like the BBC to publish their work or languages that don't have any script at all. Um, so those are limitations. You know, it set, it set them back so much because even for Yoruba that has all these texts, you know, we still have a long way to go. When you get a text from a BBC website or a personal blog of somebody writes in Yoruba, you still have to read through, get someone to read through and correct the text and make sure it's all perfectly written before you even feed it to the machine. Because it's garbage in, garbage out. If um, the same reason why Google Translate probably doesn't work as well. Because if the text you're getting it from doesn't have properly written texts, then the thing that comes out of it also is going to be terrible. Um, and so that's the Yoruba, which is also already has a big, you know, uh, population. Imagine languages that don't have that, that don't have a, a, a large um, history of pu published materials, or that don't have any script to write them. So um, Igbo, for instance, has been written with a Latin script, just like Yoruba, with modifications and stuff. But over time, people stop putting tone marks on Igbo words. And so the Igbo text you find online are also not properly written, so you can't use it for any text-to-speech application. I was able to do the TTS Yoruba for Yoruba because Yoruba has visible tone marks that are used. Um, so you can teach the computer that when you see this mark, give it the sound. When you see this mark, give it the sound. Igbo that doesn't have that makes it a lot harder. Uh, English doesn't need it because it's not a tone language. So English texts are easily, more easily um, um, used. And English also has such a large corpus online. Everybody, almost everybody online writes in English, at least a large number of people. So to create it, a, a speech technology work in English. You have so much, so much data already there. Just grab them and have someone read through, and you, you're fine. You're good to go. So that is a big issue. Um, I mentioned the number of language users. Some small languages, people don't even know about them. You know, um, and the language language number of users shouldn't have been a problem, of course, because like I would mention in a, a few slides from here, Siri uh, exists in Swedish and Norwegian and Danish, and I think Icelandic as well. Four languages in the Nordic circle that in total population are not more than 18 million, four of them at, at most, maybe 20 million, four languages. So each of them an average of 5 million each. Um, and Siri exists in each of these languages. Yoruba is spoken by over 30 million speakers, and we don't have any major, we don't have any text-to-speech application, or, you know, except for TTS Yoruba that we did, which is still not perfect and it has its own issues, um, and it's a private effort. So the monetary incentive for big corporations is to find language communities that have users that will spend money to buy their products. So if they think that Yoruba uh, language community doesn't have that uh, large number of people who would pay for it, 
then they would not create um, a, a, you know, stuff uh, for Yoruba language. Um, and so now imagine smaller African languages that don't have like huge paying population, etc. cetera. Um, the language that student mentioned earlier, it's always an issue. When we were creating the Nigerian English voice, many the questions I was always asked at Google was, you know, what do you think? Do you think people will like it when it comes out? And I've always said, well, I have two answers to you, uh, for you. There will be people who will like it and will use it because it benefits them, it helps them understand things that the old voice didn't let them, like people who are uneducated, people who, um, taxi drivers, Uber drivers, etc. cetera. Um, and there will be people abroad, Nigerians who live in foreign countries who will be interested even just for nostalgic purposes to be able to use a voice that sounds like home. But there will be people who are Nigerians who are educated, who know who otherwise would should, should embrace this product, who would say, why is my phone speaking to me in a Nigerian accent? Why not uh, a foreign accent? It's an attitudinal issue. Um, and the reason why is because they feel that anything that doesn't sound foreign is not standard. And so you would find people who would complain about it and you shouldn't worry about them because it's, you know, it's, it's a mental thing. And if they want to use British English because they like how British English sounds, let them. But there would be people who would use this product. And when it came out, surprisingly, it was not surprising for me. It was the same where people, even before the product was announced, people started hearing Nigerian English voices on their phones and they started tweeting and complaining and wondering why my phone sound like a Nigerian. If I wanted to hear my own voice, I would go outside and speak to myself or, you know, things like that. So you, you found, I, I retweeted many of them. I probably should have put them on this slide. But there are a number of people who were, you know, really pissed up, that, you know, why is Google speaking in a Nigerian accent? And it didn't, they hated it not because it was bad or because they couldn't hear what it was saying, but because it sounded like that. Um, so there is that attitude, language attitude problem. And there's the issue of not having enough linguists working in tech. Many linguists I know work in universities, you know, bringing out abstract, um, you know, um, academic work, some of which are useful for tech people, of course, um, but we need more people also working hand in hand with tech people um, to create, you know, to, to solve many of these problems in practical ways. Language, um, we talk about, um, you know, um, linguists working in language, you know, language, protecting languages from going to, in, uh, extinct and stuff like that. What they do mostly create dictionaries, primers and stuff like that, which are good, um, but technology is a very important way also to help uh, protect languages from uh, dying. So hopefully getting more linguists to work with tech people might help. Then government policies in Nigeria, for instance, we don't ask how many languages people speak when you when you're doing census? We ask ridiculous questions like, "What's your religion?" You know, for instance, which doesn't make any sense, um, or "What's your ethnic group?" Which I I think is not really important anymore in this day and age. Um, but questions like, you know, how many languages do you speak? Which one is your most dominant language? Um, how well do you speak the other languages, etc.? Would give us an idea of the languages we have in Nigeria. How many are still endangered, and stuff like that. If you go to um, ethnologue.com you know, uh, an organization that documents languages around the world, you would find that um, they don't have adequate data for many African countries because the, either there are wars or issues that prevent them from going there, or the government doesn't provide enough uh, opportunity for them to actually understand the language situation. So these, these are things that eventually affect how languages, um, uh, you know, how, how languages are perceived and how much work we can do with them. This is a screenshot of my, my Siri when I was trying to find what language is, is existing. French, German, see, it's just German, Austrian, German in Germany, German, Switzerland. It's three German variants of the voice, um, just, you know, and he, Hebrew, Italian, etc. And there's no African language here, of course. So, so this is like attitudinal issues that, you know, we have to convince big tech companies that either there's profit there or that people who would buy their products or we just do it ourselves if we can find it. Um, I was going to mention issues with Unicode and Yoruba. I mentioned the having to type uh, the tone marks on top of the thing. One of the things we created with Yoruba Names Project is a tone marker, which is free and easy to download. And it's an application rather than a physical keyboard, which can help you put the tone marks on it. Um, but one of the problems with Yoruba is that when Unicode um, gave you, you know, tried to help Yoruba, you know, properly written online, 
Um, they ran into problems uh, that I would call the, this issue with uh, precomposed characters. So when you're writing Yoruba, you have to write the U before you put the tone mark or the A before the tone mark. In many languages, the U with the, with the mark is already there or the A with the mark is already there. And Unicode has many of those things, but not all of them. There are some expressions in your, some words in Yoruba, for instance, that you have both the mark on top of it and, and marks under it, like when I'm writing my name. And yeah, my name. And you see that, you know, the, 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 the R has a mark under and the mark on top of. And when you're writing this on the computer, you have to apply each of them individually, which slows you down when you're writing. And in some other applications, like Twitter, for instance, when you're writing with a tone mark, it counts each tone mark, which new diacritic you put as a separate character. So if you have a space of you know, 140 characters, now it's 280. Every time you put a diacritic, it reduces the, the space you have. So there are issues there that um, I think needs to be fixed. Uh, we need to keep calling attention to it uh, for people who, um, who create them. Such problems I, uh, I put here because occasionally I found myself trying to find information about maybe something I've written in the past, I'm trying to find it online. And when I write my name without the marks, it gives me a different um, search results, number of search results. When I write it with the marks, it gives me a different kind. The same thing when you're searching on Twitter. So, and I think it's a problem that shouldn't exist. When you search with, with or without the marks, it should give you the same thing. Um, but these are things we have to tell the people who are in charge of to be able to help. Okay, I was trying to show you uh, this earlier. Um, so there are big opportunities for inclusion, like I said, um, for people who are not as able as we are. Accessibility, people reading, getting the phone to read stuff to them because they can't see. Um, right now we have it in English. With Google, you can use it in Nigerian English, but there are people who don't speak that, who speak only Pidgin, for instance, or speak only Yoruba. Um, so that exists. There's the issue of language diversity. In Nigeria, all the tech tools we have exist only in this language. It's English or Nigerian English of American English, et cetera. Uh, and it's a big country. You want to have people be able to uh, work together in peace. Everybody assumes that if we all speak just one language, then we would be, live happily ever after. It's not the case, of course, because you know, um, why do married people have, you know, understand each other perfectly? Like my friend Mandana said uh, last yesterday, understand each other perfectly um, the, the first month or six months of marriage. And after that, <laughs> They don't understand each other anymore. It's, it's not a language, they just speak the same language. The civil war we had in Nigeria was fought with sides that understood, that spoke British English. Many of them were educated in England. Um, and so it's not, it's, understanding doesn't always come because we speak the same language, it comes because they're able to understand what each person is trying to say. So with tech um, tools, we might give each individual language uh, opportunity to be able to participate in technology to start with and to do a couple of things that you can do as well. And when people can feel self-actualized, um, especially in the language, which is a core element of every individual, I, we believe, I believe that it's also going to help the nation as, as a whole. Um, education, it will help. Um, education, again, we have to go back to the fact that we're teaching people only in English, which, you know, teaching in English is not a bad thing. Uh, you know, as a global, a global space we are in now, English is an important, aspect. But um, if we can teach them in their own languages, and if they can use the tech tools in those languages, maybe before they even come to school, there are things they could have been able to achieve, they probably will be able to achieve um, going forward. I think there was somebody who invented a coding language in Yoruba. Um, and that I think is a great opportunity. Um, if you can code, it doesn't matter whether you can speak in English, you can use the code to do something. And that thing can benefit somebody somewhere. Um, documentation, writing, financial inclusion, I, I need to mention because it was a day I was at an ATM and somebody who was in front of me was taking too long. And I realized eventually that he couldn't understand what the ATM was saying. And what the ATM said to him was something like, um, we only dispense in multiples of 10 or something, something, something that slightly technical mathematically. And he didn't understand it because you know he hadn't gone to school. He's a business guy of around my age. And I realized banks take for granted that everybody can use the ATM machine because it's in English. Um, but there are several people who have money and who have businesses and who don't speak in English. And so they will not put their money in the bank when they realize that they will spend too much time trying to understand what the machine is saying, that they might lose their money, uh, you know, because they can't understand what it is. 
Uh, there are robots that are coming in the future. During the COVID times, there are people in hotels that have robots come bring things to their rooms and, and stuff like that. We think of all these things as cute and all of that, but every time I say it, I think when this becomes more commonplace, um, how many more people not able to speak English, which is usually the language that most of these big uh, projects uh, are in, would be able to benefit from the opportunities that these things bring. The organizations working today in African language technology, at least in Nigeria, I know about I, which I mentioned at the beginning. Eurobadems project is mine. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers. There are big tech companies doing their own thing. And depending on what skills you have, uh, data science, mathematics, linguistics, etc., you can also find a, a niche for you to um, help other people. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned this earlier, software engineering, language competence, interests, etc. And that is it. I think I've taken enough of your time. I said I was going to spend 30 minutes and I spent 45. So <laughs> thank you. And I will take your questions. And if there's any other thing uh, I forgot, I will likely bring it back. Thank you, Tajumadi, for having me. And I welcome the questions. Thank you so much, Kolatsumbosu. <laughs> For Thanks. being here, I mean, I learned a lot from your talk, um, maybe especially because I'm very fascinated about all of this language, or maybe also because I am Yoruba and it makes me so, so glad to, to hear from you. And um, so uh, before I go on about myself, I would, I would allow anyone who has question for you to please, um, you can unmute yourself to ask Color your questions. You can also type your questions on, on chats if you'd rather do that. But we are collecting questions now, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us, everyone, by the way. Uh, Kola, I had a question. Uh, yes. You had mentioned something about a, a, someone going out and coding for themselves uh for those things that they want to be able to do software wise uh, for nigerians um do you uh, and i've seen this before do you think that uh, coding itself has a um sort of an english only problem like all the commands tend to be based in english lexemes mm -hmm. so um, how do we how do we overcome that sort of anglo-centric coding problem yeah Yes, um, I, I, I think I kind of broached earlier, but I didn't dwell on it. Um, I, I read about somebody who created a coding language in Yoruba mm -hmm. called Yor Yorlang. I haven't used it. I mean, I don't code again, but I, I saw you know, people show interest in um, such a thing. Um, right now, the coding languages that exist, um, Python, you know, this and that, etc., all of them, um, again, come from the idea that everybody can understand what, you know, uh, what, is, um, what are the terms you, they use, you know, publish and it, et cetera, et cetera, all these terms that come that you have to use, that you understand them. Um, so I assume that anybody who doesn't speak in English would probably have a problem from the start, just trying to get in there. But I don't know. It's possible that if you go to a, a, a village where nobody speaks English and you want to teach someone how to code, without having gone through, through the educational system, the current British focused, English focused educational system, you will have to first teach them to understand what these words mean. So if you can get those words in a language they understand, they might have a better access, better opportunity than somebody who's having to first go through a language barrier before getting to it. So it would be nice, I assume, um, if such more opportunities like that exists. But again, I don't know what it takes to create a, a coding language. Sure. I assume that it's going to take a lot of work as well. So the person doing it must first understand you know, how the coding works in the English language and then you know, make them work in um, the local language and then teach the computer to recognize that when somebody says this, it's exactly the same thing that exists in English. There are opportunities that exist there, but people have to know that these opportunities exist and that they can benefit someone somewhere in the future. Again, English is just a medium. So... Um, you know, Albert Einstein grew up speaking German and every, every of the theories and, you know, papers is written in German before he moved to the U.S. are equally as valid as the ones he eventually wrote when he started publishing in English. It's not the language that makes it right. genius. It's the fact that, you know, he's able to express it. So you're right. 
I hope that uh, opportunities like that. Give me one second. I'll let out my dog. <laughs> All right, go on. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the um, answer. Does anyone else have a question? Again, you can unmute yourself. Oh yeah, um, Kathleen has a question. So she said, what opportunity do you see for building language tools to also tackle cultural preservation? With the prevalence of tech, we face the risk of American or Asian culture becoming the norm urban Africa? Yes. Um, yes, I, I, I do see opportunities. Um, I think that, um, so I was looking at, somebody posted a photo of them taking a train from Lagos to Ibadan. And for the first time I noticed that the welcome sign that welcome to when you get to Ibadan on a train is in Mandarin, um, which I had not noticed before. So that is that is not a tech issue. That's just a human issue of people, um, um, the government, people in charge of it agreeing to the, you know, the rules behind you know, the train contract that Mandarin would also be a part of. But it's not even Mandarin and Yoruba and, or Mandarin and English, just Mandarin and that's it. I, I wonder whether nobody just mentioned it or it was part of the contract. You know, we have to have Mandarin as the medium of instruction. That dissolves me. Um, and this is in Ibadan, which is in a Yoruba language space. So opportunities exist. Uh, we have to be aware of them um, and people have to speak up um, and find ways to make sure that, because bi bilingualism, I am fine with bilingualism, multilingualism, I speak a few languages. Um, I've been to Wales where English and Welsh is used. I've been to you know, Korea, I've been to different places. Um, and I think we can have that in Africa as well. Um, what I would have been astounded by is the resistance, you know, um, of people to the idea of true multilingualism, where you can use your language as, you know, as with in every space you want, and still balance it with English and with every other language that lives around you. So we can have Mandarin on the signboard as long as, you know, the Yoruba language that's more spoken by most people there is there you know, that's the first thing you see. And then English, which is spoken by many more people, is also there as well. So um, so I don't know whether it's tech that will solve the problem, but I think there are a lot of opportunities for, for us to embrace our multilingualism because you can't wish it away. We have spoken English for 50, 60, 100 years in Nigeria, more than 100 years. And it hasn't solved our, you know, divisions in Nigeria. So it's not going to solve, it's not a language that will solve it. Um, but what we've got at the end is our languages are receding, um, less people are speaking them, fewer people are speaking them. Um, and the tools that we are embracing, um, even doing more to re, you know, put our languages back you know, to the back of the bon uh, back bone. So I, I hope that more people who are doing tech today would um, pay more attention to these things. It's, it's, it's part cultural awareness, it's part, uh, um, uh, interest in making sure that you know uh, your languages survive, and if all of those things are present, I think we would you know think more when we are creating things to make sure that uh, we do them in a way that benefits us as well. Thank you so much for your elaborate answer. There's another question, I believe. Is um, the guy who designed the Yoruba code is to the, okay, it's not a question. I think it's just um, a link to the Yoruba code that you mentioned. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. This was very fascinating. Um, so I have a question about your points about collecting data and large corpora to, and, and that being the bottleneck for a lot of the uh, sort of deploying this thing. So um, is there, uh, because I think if you sort of leave it to, let's say, Google or a startup to collect a lot of this data, they have no incentive to release it because their product is all based on this thing. So that's how they're going to be making money. So is there a way you you can incentivize, let's say, I don't know, University of Ibadan, all the linguists at University of Ibadan should sort of take all the students there and have them create open source data set, the ones in, I don't know, uh, Kaduna, like people in regional parts mm -hmm. of different parts of Nigeria to sort of 
crowdsource this kind of thing and maybe release these data sets and that can sort of help us to sort of bridge this gap that you're talking about? Thank you, Julius. It's a good question. And I think people already do. Um, I, I've met with a couple of people who are doing things in different spaces. Um, in the north, in the south, it's not enough. We don't have enough people. Um, but you know, if people are, if they have their own jobs and they're spending all their time doing freelance work, if they care about it enough, of course, many people let it open and say, you know, we have done this. You can use it for whatever you want. Um, and I hope many of those kind of things uh, continue to to happen. Um, but you know, we need a lot of. There's always a need for manpower, grants, government support. Government support never happens anyway, but. But there are people doing stuff uh, in different spaces, and I think you make a good point. It's it's part of the things that would help us create this future. Um, but um, the the other issue I was going to mention is that so for Yoruba, for instance, we have a large history. You can just trans get the Bible and just digitize that and have a translated Bible beside it, and you can almost create a translation engine just from all the text you have. There are many languages that don't even have written materials, so you start from way back, um, you know, some languages already have, uh, they already started earlier and will have an advantage. So those kind of communities need like grants and people to support people who live there, either to create the scripts first or to make them work with the current script we have. And then, you know, get a lot of texts written out. Um, for Yoruba, you can, you can almost go to a radio station in Nigeria that have a Yoruba program and say, we just want 24 hours or 48 hours of your programming. And you get someone to transcribe it and, and translate it. You know, we could do that as well for smaller communities, but they first need to have a radio, for instance. If they don't, then you have to sit someone down, make them talk and talk, and then you have to then transcribe it. So you see the issues with each language communities are different. And you have to, you know, first you have to find people who are interested in this particular language or that particular language and then get them the resources or the motivation to be able to then use it uh, to help the language and technology. Thank you, that was a, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for the question, Julius. Um, there is another one in the chat. Um, so it says that I do agree on how language technology will help financial inclusion as I often receive complaints from the mass market segments will have bank accounts, but do not want to use digital channels. And those who don't want bank accounts, the question is, how do we get stakeholder buy-in um, for let's say the three major languages for a starter? Yeah, um, I've been surprised by the reluctance of banks to put a lot of money in research to help make more languages available on their platforms because they complain all the time about people not using the banks, you know, the unbanked in Nigeria. And yet, every time you go to the ATM machine, which you have to use because they don't want you to go into the counters and, and queue up, you have only English and maybe one or two banks have Yoruba, Igbo language options, but the options always also come in texts. So it's already assuming that everybody who wants to use the ATM can read which is also not true. So imagine if you can have an ATM where you can go to and speak Yoruba to it. I say, Mufek Bao, and he's asking you a note, and you say 200 Naira or something. And he says, you know, and ask you all the questions and you can hear it and have it respond to you. More, I, I know a lot of people that would benefit from that. Um, but you write Yoruba on the text. Yes, it's Yoruba, but not that many people who speak Yoruba can read it. Their grandparents and stuff like that, and people from different communities. So I'm surprised that the banks who have a lot of money would rather give it to superstars to dance and do something for them on their billboards or to put Christmas lights on Zumba uh, at Christmas time. So rather than put money in things that could actually benefit and bring more customers. I don't know the answer to it, um, but I, I do find it very interesting. Interesting. Is a lot of opportunities, limitations, just like you mentioned. And I hope that people that joined us or like listen to your talk in the future can recognize this and uh, try to do something. It's also start with uh, community, like uh, can 
can I kind of build tools? I know how to code. Can I um, like create some tools that can uh, like facilitate data sets collection? Can I um, share this to amongst my community? Can I can I give it to my mom to like you know donate to this too? It's all about sharing and believing that this is a really important problem. And I, I believe that uh, having more awareness can also really help us move our community for the, uh, forward because I think we will be the one to solve our problem. So I don't really believe in um, having some angel or someone to like uh, come and solve your problem, especially when there's no uh, financial incentive. So um, yeah, any yeah. more question before every round? We only have one more minute. So. <laughs> the last question here. Last okay, question Julius. Okay, let me read it out so everyone can hear. Uh, one more question, but I don't want to hug the time. <laughs> what are ways we can tackle the uh, attitudinal issues you mentioned about modern Nigerians not being as interested in the native language and thinking? If something is foreign, it is better. Maybe have more students in secondary school take it. Though, in my experience, a lot of us, myself included, ran away from Yoruba house classes prior to what? Why? <laughs> it is. There are issues in Nigeria that are beyond just. Um, let me see. How do I phrase it? There are attitudinal issues. Yeah. So I don't know how we can change that. There are political issues also that make it a lot harder, because um, in my experience, you know, you you bring up a conversation about you know using more of your language in public in not penalizing students in school for speaking their languages or using it in civil service offices, et cetera. And the first response you get from people would usually be, uh, are you trying to force your language on uh, your fellow Nigerians who don't speak the language? Or are you trying to, you know, uh, to, to marginalize them, et cetera? I've also often suggested that when a Nigerian president goes abroad, they should speak their own language when they are responding to journalists, just like Angela, Angela Merkel does. Or <laughs> I find it very interesting. If a Yoruba president goes abroad and is being interviewed, he should respond in Yoruba. And the, the journalists, they have money. The CBS, ABC, Fox, etc. they have money. They will find a Nigerian there who would translate what you've said and put it on the screen. doesn't mean you don't speak English. You understand the question. But it's a way to um, kind of... Um, um, advertise that you come from a country that speaks a different language. The question people always ask is, oh, are you saying that, you know, one language out of 500 languages should be enough, um, you know, to represent Nigeria? And my question always is, my answer is always, we had presidents come and presidents go. In 2015, we had a president who spoke Ijo. Um, before him, we had one who spoke Hausa. Before that, we had one who spoke Yoruba. So every time a new president comes, let them speak the language they speak. Uh, the people listening to them, probably can't tell the difference between languages anyway, um, but they will translate it. They will get give a job to Nigerian abroad, um, but they also know if they kind of be, are able to separate the languages that you come from a multilingual space. Um, you don't lose anything and you benefit because even the, the English you speak right now, when you're speaking in, to foreign journalists are usually closed caption on the screen because your accent is different from theirs and they still don't understand what you're saying when you're speaking it. So it really doesn't matter. So it's, but it's a way to encourage uh, the language diversity and to make people more comfortable listening to other people's languages. There's nothing evil in the fact that somebody speaking house are beside you or somebody speaking evil beside you. But we, because of our political history and a number of other issues we have in Nigeria, we tend to, tend to feel suspicious when somebody is speaking a different language beside us. Um, so that would need to change. And uh, I think politicians can help uh, make that happen. Um, and tech people can also help make that happen. The Nigerian English voice, for instance, I, I mean, you would think that it's a Nigerian English. It's not. It doesn't belong to a particular ethnic group. But still, people found a way to make it to, to ethnicize it and say, "Oh, the person, the voice sounds like an Igbo person. Sounds like a Yoruba person. Sounds like you know, it's still Nigerian English." So, there's a matter of issues that probably won't go away. Um, but we, we we still do what we need to do and hope that the future is better than the present. Okay. By the way, as a party, colloquial series, me or more What is colloquial in Yoruba? We have to find a word for it. If it doesn't exist, it's part of. My goodness. Part of okay, okay. Actually, go on you. Um, um, but I call her. Uh, from Iberi, at the answer, at the book boy. You're about me. Go do that. Mama Francis. I don't have a translator, but you don't have a translator. So, you don't have a translator. I don't understand what you're saying. So thank you but so much. I was just thinking. 
Sorry. If you had a, an automatic closed caption and everything you're saying should be <laughs> translated on the screen. Yes, definitely. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I really do appreciate everyone who took their time to, to join us and participate in this colloquium. I hope you've learned one or two things and uh, we look forward to seeing you sometimes in the future, Mr. Collar, and then also to um, having you here for other colloquium talk. By the way, um, Julius Left is going to be our next speaker and I'll be excited for his talk next month. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Just... Thank you, dog. See you later. Bye-bye. Odabo. Odabo. Bye-bye. <laughs>